and welcome back to 12 Days in March. In this fourth presentation, Dr. McGinnis will review the key principles of antiarrhythmic drugs, focusing on the class 1 agents. Sadly for you, Dr. Sachs will interject some bonus coverage just to make your lives more miserable. So grab a glass of wine and let's get started. Having said that, so I think this is a good segue to, to say that true antiarrhythmic drugs, they really work by altering the myocyte action potential, generally by blocking either sodium or potassium channels. So they all essentially are a poison to some degree that somehow messes with the sodium and potassium channels. So that's, that's important to understand. It's also important to understand that uh, all of the antiarrhythmic drugs, they're all kind of these dirty agents. So if you read about them in textbooks and things, you know, a lot of times they're described in a pure sort of fashion, like, oh, this is a, you know, this drug is a potassium channel blocker. They all have, have some degree of overlap. So you can learn about them. You can know that they're, some drug is mostly a sodium blocker or mostly a potassium blocker, but you do need to understand that, that there's often some degree of overlap couple of points that are definitely worthwhile for you to have an awareness of. So any drug that has potassium channel activity, for that reason, if you think way back to when we started, if you're messing up with the efflux of potassium ions, if you're causing some problem there, those drugs all have the potential to prolong the process of repolarization. And so you can wind up with a longer QT interval. When you have a long QT interval, that is a setup for which arrhythmia specifically? Torsad, right? So... Anyone, if they're going to show you torsad, if there's anything to do with torsad, it always has to do with some issue with QT prolongation and generally with poisoning of, of uh, potassium channels. It's also worthwhile to realize that there can be these bystander reentry loops, especially in the left ventricle. For the most part, the great majority of ventricular tachyarrhythmias occur when the LV is sort of suffering and scarred and has been injured, and uh, the LV is riddled with these kinds of donut loops. And as appealing as it may sound to be riddled with donuts, the reality is the LV does not like it. So the problem is that when you then marinate the left ventricle in a poison, when you start manipulating all of these, changing the sodium and potassium currents, you might get the, the causative donut. You might treat this one loop and have things be better, but it's possible that there could be other bystander loops bystander donuts that weren't causing a problem, and then when you give the drug, you, you create a problem. So that is one reason why, and, and it's important to have an awareness of this, that a, a, a known side effect of antiarrhythmic drugs is arrhythmias. Okay, so there's these Vaughn Williams classifications of antiarrhythmic drugs. This is the most commonly used sort of uh, menu in terms of thinking about how antiarrhythmic drugs are put together. It's frankly, it's not a terribly accurate or great depiction because of, like I said, all the drugs have these kind of mixed effects to them, but it is the most popular classification scheme. So class one agents are sodium channel blockers. Class two agents are beta blockers. But if you recall what I said before, beta blockers, when someone uses the phrase, we're going to give an antiarrhythmic drug, they're generally not talking about regular kind of vanilla flavored beta blockers or calcium channel blockers, class four. So even though there's like five classes here, two of them, class two and class four, are kind of fake. They're not real, true antiarrhythmic drugs in the sense that most people reference them. So class one, sodium blockers, uh, class three, primarily potassium blockers, and then class four is miscellaneous agents. Okay, so let's talk about some specific drugs. These are all antiarrhythmic drugs that are intended to be sort of like somewhat high yield, where there's some little tidbit that the boards might want to ask you about. Before Dr. McGinnis walks us through this topic, I would like to set the stage for the antiarrhythmics focusing on high-yield derivatives. So you will need to have familiarity with how the agents do affect the action potential. Since class 1 agents block the sodium channel, you can anticipate changes in phase 0 of the action potential reflected in the QRS complex. Class 3 agents block the potassium channel, so you would note changes to phase 3, or repolarization, of the action potential, which corresponds to the QT interval on the EKG. Insofar as the class 1 drugs, I remember them with the mnemonic PROLIFIC, reflecting the prototypic agents including procainamide, lidocaine, and flecainide. PROLIFIC. And each drug has unique take-home points that the USMLE will want you to be familiar with. And each of these points relate to how phase zero is inhibited and how this, in turn, is reflected by the action potential. 
Diagrammatically, you will see that the older class 1A agents prolong the action potential, whereas lidocaine as a class 1B agent shortens the action potential, making it an ideal agent for the most vulnerable patients, those being with acute MI. And class 1C, the newer class of drugs, have the unique property of strong inhibition of phase 0 without prolonging the action potential. But let's face it, this sounds like nonsense. So what are the key nuances to be familiar with? I'm going to start with class 1B, which include lidocaine and mixilitine. The take-home is weak effects on phase 0 with no prolongation of the action potential and rapid dissociation from the sodium channel, which makes them a safe agent to use in the perinfarction period, especially with rapidly depolarizing injured tissues. Whereas these agents are rarely used anymore, this is their unique niche to be familiar with. In this slide, I've included the other archaic 1A agents, including quinidine and diisopyramide for completeness, and the newer 1C agents, including flecainide and propafenone. I think it will be useful to compare and contrast the 1A and 1C class. They either have modest to strong effect on phase 0, which by itself is not a killer, but what does matter is how this impacts the action potential. As you can see, the 1A agents prolong the action potential, and they themselves predispose to arrhythmia, and torsade in particular. 1C agents, which have a strong effect on phase 0, do not prolong the action potential. Dr. McInnes will address use dependence, but the take-home has to do with the dissociation from the sodium channel. At faster heart rates, there is less time for dissociation, resulting in widening of the QRS, which is the little niche or nuance that the USMLE is apt to take note of. And here I summarize the key takeaways. 1A agents will prolong the action potential and predispose to torsade. 1B weakly affects the action potential and quickly dissociates from the sodium channel, making them safe in the perinfarction period, and the 1C agents demonstrate use dependence that Dr. McInnes will expand upon. And lastly, you will need to be familiar with the drug-induced lupus complication associated with procainamide, characterized by the generation of antihistone antibodies and more typically seen in patients described as slow acetylators. And now let's return to our expert, Dr. McInnes. So, procainamide. Procainamide is considered a class 1A agent, so it is uh, largely a sodium-blocking drug. It is metabolized to this metabolite called NAPA, NAPA, and this has a longer half-life to it than regular plain old procainamide. Procainamide is modestly effective, it's modestly proarrhythmic, it's sort of uh, just a modest agent, but interestingly, it has this property to it that it's associated with drug-induced lupus, so here's this picture of this person who has a malar rash as a result of uh, being on procainamide, and also with this antihistone antibody production. So these are like two little details that you want to know or have some understanding about with procainamide because you know they're going to ask you about some person who has atrial fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia. They get treated with some drug. They develop lupus. What's the story here? And the real story is that procainamide is almost never uh, used in contemporary clinical practice like in the past. Lidocaine and mexilotine, these are class 1B agents. It's used for ventricular arrhythmias. It's especially useful in the context of myocardial ischemia. So if patients have ventricular arrhythmias in the setting of a myocardial infarction, lidocaine would be a drug that could potentially be reached for. There's not a whole lot of nuances about lidocaine. You just want to know that lidocaine is a sodium channel blocker. It also does not have a ton of contemporary clinical use. All right, flecainide and propafenone. So these are class 1C agents. They have very strong, very potent sodium channel blocking effect. And so the diagram of what happens with, with 1C is, is perhaps the diagram that most uh, appropriately reflects what we would expect the physiology to be, right? So you poison a bunch of sodium channels, you slow down this phase zero process, you slow down the depolarization, and it, it kind of all nicely hangs together. Flecainide and propafenone are used almost exclusively for atrial fibrillation. What's helpful to know here, or what you might be asked about, is that these drugs demonstrate this phenomenon of what's called use dependence. Use dependence refers to the fact that the process of the drug falling off of the sodium channel that it is inhibiting is dependent on time. You need a certain amount of time for, uh, for that to take place. 
And so if the heart rate itself is faster, if the patient has tachycardia, there is literally less time for the drug to fall off the sodium channel. And so the faster the heart rate when the patient has tachycardia, the effect of the drug can actually be more pronounced. And so as a result, for a drug like flecainide, you might have a therapeutic dose and everything might be sort of, you know, hunky-dory. And then if the patient develops, say, atrial fibrillation with tachycardia, despite the fact that they're on flecainide, because none of these drugs are perfect, if the patient develops atrial fibrillation and has a lot of tachycardia with the flecainide in their system, you can see that the whole QRS complex can widen out for exactly this reason, whereas at baseline, the QRS complex may have still remained narrow. So normal flecainide therapy, the QRS should be narrow. If the patient develops tachycardia, you could see QRS widening or some other kind of increased effect, but most of the time it's QRS widening, okay? Use dependence, that's one of these. Each of these drugs sort of has like one little kind of buzz phenomenon that you want to have some connection with. So for flecainide and propafenone, it's use dependent. All right, we're winding down. In our final presentation, Dr. McInnes will review class three agents and the miscellaneous class five agent adenosine. Stay tuned.